What's up, Steelers fans? Welcome to Around the Berg. We're going to jump into our Week 5 recap of a Steelers victory over the Denver Broncos, 27-19. to 19. Shane, this was a really fun, interesting game from top to bottom. Absolutely, and I will say that it seems like my energy is stronger with the being wrong thing as far as picks goes because I was wrong this week, and you yes. were right about the, the win. So I have more of that energy going on, so I'll have to make sure that I pick against us for the rest of the week. <laughs> <laughs> right. All right, so first first things first, I do want to apologize to those who listen. Uh, we did record a preview of this game, mm-hmm. but we had some logistical errors uh, getting it published, so you know, we're going to look in the mirror. We're going to, you know, go back to, you know, go back to the drawing board. We're going to reassess what we're doing and, you know, come back stronger the next week. And we're going to make sure that. Exactly. Right. (laughs) And yeah, obviously, you know, the standard is the standard iron sharpens iron. Yada, yada, yada. All right. But anyway, anybody um, see Castellanos anywhere? I think they're not in the playoffs. (laughs) So don't worry about that. All right. Good. Anyways. um, But yeah, so this, this was a very exciting game. uh, Like I said earlier, and you know, at one point I was thinking, okay, this is like the most complete game the Steelers have played since like the Bengals win last year. Yeah. And then Broncos come back, you know, and again, like I think the defense, you know, obviously they didn't, you know, finish the game as well as you'd hope, but I, I got to give credit to the Broncos. Like they played a very good game and, you know, they get paid too. Like they're going to make some plays. Absolutely. And I think that a lot of it was just, they just didn't possess the football very much, especially mm-hmm. in the first half. The Steelers run game, which we'll talk a lot about, I'm sure, in this uh, recap here, uh, was able to keep the ball in the Steelers' hands most of that first half. Don't let Teddy Bridgewater you know, get things going. And eventually, inevitably, they got the chance to do that late. And we saw that this Broncos team is a very good football team on offense whenever they get rolling. For sure. And I, I do want to say, like, this is kind of one thing I want to get out of the way, is that I think somebody needs to pay Mark Schlereth a lot more money. As a, yeah, he, he is was an, really good. He is an awesome booth analyst yeah like and you know it's a lot of like guys like they'll kind of stumble over their words and they'll make these like weird references or they <laughs> won't really talk about scheme or anything but I, like schlereth was identifying stuff and talking about stuff that was like super relevant so the one thing that i thought was most important and this was the case for most of the game is i think the steelers so their game plan and schlereth said this was that okay we're gonna come out and stop the run game for the broncos and we're gonna play one-on-one on the outside and basically say if, if bridgewater if you want to throw the ball down the field and try to beat us with your receivers. We're going to, you know, we think we can win those matchups most of the time, but we're going right. to stop the run game. And they did that for the most part in the first half and even into the third quarter. Then Broncos start throwing the ball. They make those plays. The Steelers are a little slower to respond to that. So the Broncos keep making those plays until the Steelers finally adjust and they are able to finally get that big stop at the very end of the game. But I think that that was the big story in terms of the Broncos offense versus the Steelers defense. And that, like you said, this, the Steelers defense was able to get the Broncos to turn the ball over very quickly because they were loading the box, stopping the run game, putting the Broncos in situations where they had to make big plays, throwing the ball. And early in the game, they just couldn't do that. And I, like you said, and Schlereth talked about it too, is like outside of that big 49 yarder that busted on that mm-hmm. sweep or that toss that happened with Williams, mm-hmm. they really didn't run the football very no. well much at all in the game. And that's, yeah. and that was something that, if they could, if the Steelers' defense could prevent that from happening, I did expect us to be able to possess the ball more in the first half and keep them off the field. Especially Bridgewater coming back, he hasn't much had much practice time because of the mm-hmm. concussion. Which again, we didn't even think really for sure he was going to be able to play. So him playing yeah. all was you know big for them. But yeah, as you like, he started to get it rolling. He was able to avoid pressure. The pressure was there occasionally. Like we didn't have a bad day as a pass rush, but he was just finding gaps to, to run mm-hmm. into and then throw the ball down the field. And it's just hard to cover that long, especially if he can make plays extended like that. So, yeah. And I think to begin the game, the Broncos like, we're like, okay, like we're going to try to beat you, you know, mono a mono running the right. ball. And they kind of kept at that at it. And, you know, they had those three and outs. And then by, by the time they got to halftime, you know, they only had, you know what three or four drives and they were yeah. all three and outs i think i'm gonna pretty pull much up yeah. the, the drive chart here so yeah so they go punt field goal after the fumble punt field goal punt so yeah you know, not they a lot kind going of, on exactly so and then in the second half they kind of switched up their strategy it's like okay like we're down we need to throw the ball and and you know they were they're mar- missing jerry judy missing kj hamler but i mean Cortland Sutton had a great game tim patch made a ton of clutch yeah, plays tim Patrick was great, which, yeah huh? you yeah you talked about him last in our preview which you know is lost to the ether yeah unfortunately but, <laughs> yeah but yeah tim but Patrick yeah, is a really good wide receiver um yeah so i i i think the the issue for the steelers though is that they i don't i don't love how they were not able to get it as much pressure as i'd hoped you know 
they they got two sacks, you know, and I, I think maybe only I guess they got two and then one got called back because of holding. Yeah, we, um, we took the penalty to post, which actually yeah. would have probably been better if we didn't. But yeah, that's, yeah that I think there was sometimes. another one that got called for holding. So, yeah, you know, so. if you want to call it. So that's basically four sacks. So but I just feel like they weren't able to really, you know, affect Bridgewater throwing. And he's a guy where if you can affect him physically, that's really going to change his ability to, to competently throw the ball. I don't think they were able to do that enough, especially late in the game. And that's something that is, I, I think part of that is Watt and Highsmith not being hundred percent healthy, but you know, they were still giving it their all mm-hmm. throughout the game. So I'll, I'll give them credit for that. Yeah. Like with Bridgewater, like you said, he, he's not a very talented thrower in terms of just pure arm strength. So if you can mm-hmm. affect his ability to throw the ball, like you said, get him off his spot or make him make plays out of structure mm-hmm. that he is getting hit. He doesn't have that arm talent to kind of make those crazy throws, but he was able to find gaps in the defense where he's able to find space and then set his feet and throw. And that's where he really hurt us a lot. Exactly. Like that big fourth down throw yeah. to Sutton where uh, uh, the coverage I didn't love there. Cause they basically just had uh Schobert and yeah. one of the corners kind of, and they bit on the short route and let yeah. that go open. So that's not great. Uh, and then I guess kind of the, the touchdown to Hinton where Mollett couldn't find Hinton on the slide route. Um, so you know, I, I think Mollett's playing pretty well. You know, so they've kind of plugged him in as the slot, as the main slot corner. He's playing quite well, I think. Yeah, uh, overall, kind of, for sure. Yeah. Um, I'm trying to think of, so let's see what else happened. I mean, so Devin Bush goes out in the second half with a leg injury. Uh, we do, I, don't, I don't really remember seeing what happened, so I'm not I sure. I know that it apparently is considered a groin injury, which is just oh at this God, point, every... basically just the weekly injury for the Steelers. Yeah. And then Juju, obviously, we'll talk about, you know, with right. that injury with him. I think it was considered a shoulder, ultimately. Yes. Yeah. So we'll see what happens with him. But he's getting been getting banged up, you know. And... Yeah, I mean, he's just getting <laughs> – he's taking just shots yeah. every play. But, but yeah, so Bush goes out. And it was – early in the game, I noticed they were playing Spillane a good bit. Yeah, they were. Which, Especially yeah. on passing downs, which I was like, that's pretty surprising. But I didn't really see him ever get – burned no, he, or targeted he actually almost anything? had i think he almost had a pick on one play like he seemed yes like he was yes, yes 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 mm-hmm. and it just it he got past him but he wasn't yeah. out of position at least which is really yes. like to ask for with him yeah so uh, you know linebackers played really well i thought the the defensive line play, i mean cam hayward had another elite game you know I think two, he had, what, two or th- two or three pass breakups yeah which were huge i think they were at least both at least two of them were on third down yeah, you know huge sure. plays you know and i think he kind of opened up the ability for guys like henry mondu and um Isaiah Loudermilk. Isaiah Loudermilk had the sack that got called back yes, for holding. He did. Yeah. But you know, two guys who you know have kind of taken their lumps early, but were able to make big plays in this game, which was awesome to see. Um, secondary had you know had some blips. You know, obviously Pierre gives up another big touchdown. Which you know, <laughs> back to your point, it's like why are they leaving him one on one with really good receivers? <laughs> it's it's tough with him because like I really think he has good coverage ability. He mm-hmm. just he can't play vertical routes very well. He just doesn't have the speed. Like he has to affect the receiver early on. If he doesn't get hands on him and keep him at the line an extra second or two to give himself time, he's gonna get beat down the field. Mm-hmm. And I understand like that is a knock on him to a certain extent. And I even t- I tweeted about it actually. Like mm-hmm. they, they ha- he's kind of hurting himself really badly with these plays. But Pittsburgh has to understand, especially if it's against Cortland Sutton. Like regardless of how good Patrick was in this game, Sutton is the number one receiver for yeah. this team right now. Mm-hmm. You cannot let your least experienced corner be the and the guy the guy that's a four six player. Like he's not going to run down the field with guys. You can't leave him with no help over the top in a game like this where they're trying to come back in the game. Yeah, I think ironically, in a, in a game where the Steelers' defense kind of played a pretty complete game, I would argue yeah. this was the game where they kind of let the other team's very clear number one offensive weapon yeah. beat them repeatedly. Whereas in the last few games, you know, they kept Devontae Adams in check, they kept Stephon Diggs in check. You know, they've done a good job of that, but then this week they just they didn't do that. Um, but I mean, you know, we say all that about Pierre, and then he made two huge plays yeah. at the very in the last drive where he had a big breakup that should have been an interception. Uh, right around the goal line, and then he had the game ceiling interception, which I thought actually again Schlereth called this out really well. Like um, Pierre just knew that route. Like he's like, yeah. okay, he's we're going inside, but he's going to cut back in that corner. Like he was around before Sutton was even looking, and he was like, he he eyed the ball before yeah. Sutton had even like turned his head to look for it. So he's like, I'm getting this pick and I'm ending this game. And I think Hayden had a big break up in the end zone again. You know, yeah, Edmonds, he did. Edmonds had a great game. He did it's, again, yeah. Fitzpatrick missed he missed the tackle on that sweep, but he had another he had a few other really big tackles. Like I think he he cut off a jet sweep play. Mm-hmm. You know, he's you know obviously locking down most of the top the top end of the defense. So, you know, I think a overall 
especially when you consider like how well they were able to shut down the Broncos offense early in the game. Yeah. Overall, a really good game from the defense. You know, the Broncos got them sometimes on big plays, but I think this was a pretty good effort from them from top to bottom. Yeah. And like you said, Pierre did acquit himself really nicely again in those situations where he's in short areas of the field or he doesn't have to worry about being challenged vertically. He does a good job sticking with guys. I rarely see him really get beat beat. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, you know, some, a good throw is going to beat anybody realistically, but a lot of the time it's taking something in that of that regard to actually beat him. And we saw at the end of the game, he saw that route coming like Slareth talked about and he just made that decision. It was there the whole time for the ball. So. For sure. All right. So I think that that kind of covers the defense and we'll move over to the offense now. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> so so that. the thing I tweeted and I, I don't know if you're a Lord of the Rings fan at all. I've I know of it. I'm not. Okay. You know, I've, yeah. So. so the quote that I came that I returned to was it's the quote from Galadriel when the fellowship kind of gets out of Moria, goes to Lothlorien and they're all kind of down bad because Gandalf had just died, alleged, yeah. you know, allegedly. Yeah. Right, but she yeah. says, the quest balances on the edge of a knife, stray but a little, and it will fail. Mm. And I think that really encompasses what the Steelers offense is right now. Because yeah. if there is any kind of negative play that gets them off schedule, a penalty, a tackle for loss, an incompletion on an early down, usually that, that drive is pretty much doomed. Yeah. <laughs> So, because we saw, you know, Chooks had two false starts. We saw yeah. a holding call on Kendrick Green, an ineligible downfield, which it was, that close. Rule, that, it, it was I, close. I think, I think honestly, like, I think this is a rule the NFL needs to change to allow offenses to just get a little. I, I know, like, scorings, you know, it's already going up and all that, but like, right. give them two or three yards to do that because that that was really close i thought yeah, on I, I think especially like when you think about it with the rise of the rpo game in mm -hmm. the nfl i think that that would be a rule change that would make sense mm -hmm. because you're you're asking these offensive linemen to essentially run block constantly on these rpos because they have to assume that the ball the running back could get the ball so they can't just sit there in their pass yeah. sets and you mm -hmm. know wait for the ball to get handed off so it's it's really it puts a lot of pressure on the quarterback to make a decision maybe quicker than he wants to Mm -hmm. And it puts a lot of you know a lot on the offensive line to make sure that they're not firing out too much, or else you get in trouble with that. So I definitely agree with you there. But it was a close call, either right? Way. Or or just you know say like you can't go anywhere, and like if you are like one yard past the line of scrimmage and it's a throw, you're done. Like like either like call it all the time, or right? Because then you can no. coach it up in a exactly. Way that, or then and then that might like kind of eliminate the RPO in general, which would kind of suck. But. Well, you yeah, know, but. I would say just kind of make it an easier call for, right. you know, specific plays. But I think for the most part, this was the Najee Harris game. Yes. In that he had his first 100 yard rushing effort, even though he had to come out of the game because he was cramping. Apparently mm -hmm. he mentioned in the post game that because of the humidity, he was just kind of getting cramps in his leg. And you could see it. He was trying to stretch it out. You know, they yeah. had him on the sidelines and, you know, Benny Snell and Kalen Blodge had to play a lot late in the game, which wasn't <sighs> ideal. Uh, but. I mean, a really impressive game from like we saw the ability to, you know, create yards after contact. And, and this was a game where the contact wasn't coming in the backfield. The contact was coming like two or three yards down the field. So that's a really big, I think, a point of progress for the offensive line and this offense in general. Yeah, and I actually just before we got on, I just finished writing something up about mm -hmm. the ground game and, and Harris and everything. And I think the difference that you can tell is we've been talking a lot about the offensive line the entire season so far, and for good mm -hmm. reason, for mostly bad things. But Harris did have his own things that he had to question a little bit, and he did have to show more as far as vision and timing mm -hmm. of things. Everything kind of came together in this game. Mm -hmm. The line finally gave him just enough room most times to actually get the chance to make a decision, find the hole, burst through it, get those north-south yards, three, four, five yards at a clip. And I think that is the key to this offense working is – and you mentioned it before, if we have a negative play, the drive is pretty much over most mm -hmm. of the time. Like we just don't have the element of the downfield passing game consistently, not even the downfield, but like just the 10 to 15 yard range. Mm -hmm. We don't have that incorporated in our offense enough. So you get second and 12 or third and nine, like it just doesn't mm -hmm. really work. So Harris consistently getting seven, eight, nine yards on the first two carries of the drive makes it a lot easier on Ben and Canada with the play calling. Some of the stuff that they have been doing that doesn't work when it's third and nine does now start to work opposed to before. So, yeah. And I think that's what, that's what was so helpful for the Steelers offense in the first half. And that, you know, the open, they had another opening drive touchdown and, you know, a yeah. lot of it was, you know, get four yards on first down with the run, get uh, five, get like three to five more yards on second down 
So you get third and one to third and three, and you can convert that easily. And they did a lot of, you know, I, I think, that, you know, I, I'm not sure what Ben's injury status at some point he was holding his arm. He had, he had all some, sorts of little stuff. Throughout yeah. The game. Like, and he, he had a few off target throws, but then kind of towards the end of the game, like he was, you know, throwing ropes. It was great. So, you know, I'm not really sure what that was, but you know, early in the game, he was finding a lot of guys like on short passes on third and shorts. And, you know, he found Ebron found Friar Muth found uh, Claypool, Claypool know, Deontay. Wanted. Like every, he was, he was yeah. like distributing the ball very well on those money downs. And that's what kept the Steelers offense going. You know, they had the touchdown, the next drive, they had the fumble, but they were moving the ball. Well, uh, they had a punt and then, or another field goal punt and then another touchdown drive. And so, and, and I, again, like this is something that we have now is actually kind of bad because the Steelers are now it's seeming able to f- create explosive plays. Most of which I think is becoming is coming from after the catch plays by like guys like Clayton yeah. and Deontay. And I th- the thing with the Steelers offense, like even today, like Ben did have several big throws that he would have mm-hmm. missed in the last few weeks from mm-hmm. what I've seen. He still had some bad misses, like the Ray yes. Ray miss like, that ended up not really mattering because I think that was the yeah. drive that, yeah, the field goal end up, not the mm-hmm. leverage penalty. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Very yeah. much else. But like there were still plenty of misses or just throws that he needed to put in different places to be complete. But he hit on enough plays that were there for the taking and that gave his guys chances to run. Like mm-hmm. Claypool had a huge day after the catch. Mm-hmm. Like he was catching those 10, 15 yarders plays and just taking them 50, 60 yards. It yes. felt like. And the, the touchdown throw to him as well, that was probably outside of maybe the deep ball to Johnson that opened the game, the best throw of the day. I think that that was, that might've been Ben's best throw of the season. It's, it's really, it's going to be because, you know, I think, I think that those like, you know, kind of deep shots, the sideline, you know, he has missed some of those. So I think that's kind of just like, Oh, this one worked. Right. (laughs) This one like was in time. Yep. Like on a, on, on a, on a rope, you know, into kind of like splitting defenders yeah. and, you know, and putting it in a place where you can, a guy like Claypool can use his size to his advantage. Right. You know, and that, that's like a big part of like, when you're talking about accuracy with quarterbacks, it's not just about like delivering a catchable ball. It's about, you know, kind of knowing your receivers and, you know, like maximizing yards after catch. And again, in the end zone, it doesn't matter, but maximizing yards after catch, protecting your receivers and like knowing like, okay, like I'm not going to try to put a ball like as high as I can for Deontay Johnson. Right. But I will try it for Chase Claypool because he has the body and the jumping ability to come down with it. And that's where Ben's really biggest issue this year has been is the ball placement. Like mm-hmm. yes. he's had plenty of true misses where he just doesn't even get it close. But like it's it's less so that and more so getting the ball where the ball needs to be to give his receivers a chance. Like mm-hmm. he missed Juju several times on in breaking routes where he threw it behind him or past him. We saw the misses last week to him. This game, there was a lot less of that. He did have a couple of the bad misses, but he finally hit on a lot of the plays that you're going to have to hit if you want this offense to work. Right, and I think I, I, I'll say this: I think there were so you mentioned the leverage penalty on Draymond yeah. Jones, which gave the Steelers um, kind of new life, and they were able to turn that field goal into touchdown, which was huge. And there was another penalty earlier in the game, and I can't remember if it was on the Steelers or oh, okay, so there was the it was the. Um, it was the penalty on Kyle Fuller as defensive pass interference. So two, oh, yeah. Yes. Yeah. So two huge Broncos penalties really, I think, changed how this game played out because on that play, you know, Kyle Fuller commits defensive pass interference. Steelers get the ball to the one yard line. Two plays later, Najee Harris goes airborne touchdown. On the field goal, you know, that's a, that's a big swing. And, you know, that is yeah. ultimately it's still an eight point game, but, and it doesn't really change how the Broncos play their end of game strategy. But, that is a huge you know, change because Steelers go from having a field goal to Ben throwing that beautiful touchdown to Claypool in the end, middle of the end zone. So I think, the, you know, yeah. penalties are part of the game and, you know, Steelers had their fair share as well, but those two penalties were extremely high leverage in the ability for the Steelers to win this game. Yeah. And obviously, you know, you hope that you're on the right end of those most weeks and it helps a lot in the NFL. We've seen the ref, the refing can definitely have more of an impact on the game than we'd like. But I think in those cases, they were deserved penalties, especially the leverage thing, which mm-hmm. is such a funny penalty because it very rarely gets called. But every time it does, I'm always like, really? Leverage? That's what we're calling? <laughs> it's like, and I mean, yeah. it is, I get why it's a penalty. I mean, you can't really use the backs of the offensive linemen to try to get taller and, and block stuff. So it is, it is you know, interesting that that's how we scored that touchdown. And I think mm-hmm. it's, I will say though, we haven't been taking advantage of stuff like that. This yes. Year. So even though it was the benefit because of a mistake by the, the opponent, it's still something that Ben paid off, which is something yes. we've been struggling to get happen. And, so. and I was extremely worried because like, I was like, oh man, they're going to like 
take this field goal off the board and like Ben's gonna throw an interception. Like he had two that Alexander Johnson should yeah. have had interceptions on where he was now. The first one was definitely Ben's fault. The yeah, second one, Najee fell down. Yeah, and that, you know, fell. That, that happens, but a lot of people were, were ripping Ben more for the second one. And I'm like, did you see what happened? The yeah, first one? yeah. Like, the first one totally was like a mistake by Ben. The second one was he, I mean, Harris fell on the ground. I don't know what you yeah. want Ben to do. I, I just yeah. want to say this, you know, as, as somebody who I'm not even sure how much this happens in real life, but it's just been such a part of my experience playing Madden. Oh. As somebody who's been repeatedly victimized by the Patriots running halfback angle, oh my where the God. running back runs that little like corner, like inside corner route, and you know just goes for a big gain. The fact that the Steelers are finally doing that with Najee just kind of warms my heart. In that, you know, yeah. we can actually finally do this. Um, so a few other notes. So like you mentioned, Juju gets hurt, um, yeah. takes a big shot from Cream Jackson, and you know they showed on the broadcast he seemed to be in a lot of pain. So. Yeah. I'm not sure what the long-term ramifications are of that just yet, but I mean, it seems like he might miss some time, yeah. which is completely fair. I mean, he seemed to be in a lot of pain. So, you know, James Washington missed this game, which sucks. So, you know, hopefully that's kind of a one week injury from and they can get, you know, back to having a pretty competent three wide receiver package. Yeah, it sucks for Juju a lot because obviously he struggled this year to get going because of yeah. really most, it's, I, I will say like watching back some of the games and getting a chance to look at it, like it really is more Ben. Not yeah, like he had in. that he had that one dig route where Ben just yeah. threw it on the opposite side of the corner who was trailing him, which I just yeah, why are you throwing that? I don't know. Like it seems like either to me, I don't think it could be miscommunication between these two this often because no. they've played together for, for yeah, a long exactly. time and can and they're both been in the offense for just as long. So it just seems like something about throwing to him it just isn't working right now. And I'm hoping, like you said, Washington gets back and those they can be the top three guys because it's looking more and more like unless, you know, maybe his market fizzles out because of the season mm, that he's had so yeah. far, it's looking more and more like he might not be back. And if that's the case, getting to see what three guys we have outside of him look like together as the top three guys, mm-hmm. I want to see what that looks like, see if it's something worth continuing to do. So, Yeah, and I think the one – the thing I want to talk about with the other wide receivers was I think it was the Steelers final offensive drive that led to a field goal with the two RPO throws by Ben, which are absolutely incredible. So the first one was kind of, kind of a, I guess this was a a less designed RPO in that. I think Ben, it was like one of those, like where it's under center. Yeah. He fakes the back, but then quickly turns around and fires the slant to, I believe it was Deontay Mm -hmm. and then got, gets a big run after catch gain. Then the next one, this, I thought this one was like, this is something I hadn't seen before from Ben where he, I think he had the RPO to the field side and then he pumps, goes back to the left side and finds Claypool again, who gets a big game, which was at like two back-to-back plays, which were absolutely nuts from Ben. Yeah. He seemed a lot more in control of the offense in this game. And he seemed mm-hmm. a lot more willing to make decisions past just the first read and make, make mm-hmm. more decisions that are what we'd expect from a veteran quarterback like him. And that's, what's going to have to continue to happen within the confines of this offense, if it's going to work, because these first read throws, like they're nice when they're working and like to get like quick yards, but you can't rely on them nearly as much as we have been relying on them. And it's nice to see that not be the case this week for sure. Yeah. Even, even so I still think like, like we mentioned like early in the game when they had all those third and shorts, you know, he was finding, you know, he found Fryer, he found Ebron. They, they had the, St- the Steelers ran a tight end screen. Yeah, which gentry and it worked. worked. Yeah, exactly. and it worked. And I'm it like, was absolutely incredible. <laughs> I was, I'm like, wait, is that Zach Gentry with the football right now? And I'm like, oh my god, it is. And he actually he did a pretty good job. Yeah. Honestly, just getting north. And so I'm like, all right. I mean, I would have rather maybe run it to someone else, but I guess it doesn't matter. If it I don't that well. I don't care that. I mean, I, like we talked about last week, is like the whole point of Gentry is that you like you think it's a run, right? And so and like, I guess if it works, yeah. So but. yeah, so like, and then you know, I like Fire and Ebron didn't have you know big games in terms of yardage or targets, but like they. I don't think any of them had drops. They had, you know, I think their two catches were for first downs. So, you know, those are important plays that keep like, like we've been talking about is keeping the offense on schedule, which is yeah. great to see. Pat had two, two, I think he only had two for seven, but both third down conversions. Mm-hmm. I think yep. honestly, I think both on certain, I think. Yeah. As well. yeah so like, honestly, if that, if they're not going to use him as much as we would like him to be used, if you're at least going to target him on money downs, the guy that's not going to probably drop anything, mm-hmm. at least at the very least, I'm happy with that, especially if you can get the run game going like you have. That's yeah. all I've been asking for so far. So speaking of the run game, you know, we saw Benny Snell and Kalen Balaj get a decent amount of carries. And th- this might be heretical for our podcast stance, but Benny Snell was better than Kalen Balaj. Today he was. Yes. yes. Now, a lot of that was the nine yard run on the, the little 
tossed the best run of Benny Snell's career. It probably yeah, realistically, <laughs> it lo- he looked better on that run. Yeah, at least Norm lives. But you can tell like when when Harris isn't in the game, even though the run blocking mm-hmm. was a lot better today than it's mm-hmm. been. I mean, we had in total in this game, we had 35 carries, 12 of which were not from Harris. Mm-hmm. And the 12 carries we had that weren't him, we had a total of 25 yards. Yep. Like that's that tells you all you need to know about as much as the run blocking was better this game, it's really mm-hmm. about Harris taking advantage of the the small gaps that he was getting. Like you could tell he was cutting, finding lanes, getting north and south. And he's just such a powerful guy that yeah. once he can make a decision and actually get going, mm-hmm. he was getting two, three, four yards of carry after he was getting tackled half the time. Mm-hmm. And that's just something that none of the other guys have the ability to do in the same way. Yeah. And like Snell obviously had that big drop on a, yeah, that, he could, that, that, that was really frustrating. When I saw that. I, 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 I wish I was talking at the time. It's like, you should have seen my face. I was like, <laughs> you're telling me you dropped a wide open pass. You get in the game and you get a pass on you, which is already not the right thing to mm-hmm. do. Like if you're going to put him on the field, I mean, they're leaving him open for a reason. Right. Exactly. Like, and they were right to do so. Mm-hmm. And, if you're going to put him on the field, at least use him as an actual running back and not as a pass catcher because he's not going to do that. Like mm-hmm. I think he has more drops this year than catches. I'd be I'd be willing to get to bat. that. That sounds right. Right. And like I don't know what it is with him. And I even tweeted about it like right after that. I'm like, get him. Like I don't want to see him again. No. Like I, again, we've talked about it before. I don't have anything against Snell as a person. Mm-hmm. He's a great guy. He he can't play. Like he just he doesn't bring anything to the offense. No. And if you're not going to bring anything to the offense, at least give the guy who, yeah, Balaj wasn't good today, mm-hmm. and he didn't have a lot of room in most of the cases, but he yeah. at least has the ability to make something happen if given room. Yeah, there was a play where like he kind of and he juked out like the nose tackle, and like you're like, oh, like of course a running back juked a nose tackle, but like the Benny, Benny Snell probably doesn't juke out the, <laughs> the nose tackle. I don't think he does. Yeah. I'm not confident he could juke out either one of us. If I'm being no. completely honest. With and like the thing about. Bellage and like I, I, I would kind of want them to say this to him. It's like, listen, like if you're getting a carry, just go full bore into wherever your your gap, like wherever you're going, whatever gap you're being told to run through, just sprint through it as fast as you can and just put your head down and try to like just churn out some yards with leg drive. Like I don't need you, like yeah. just don't juke around, just just go. Realistically, you know? he's I mean, he's just about as big as Harris. Yeah, they're, the better, like, they're pretty much the same size. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. So like he should be that should be his mentality, right? Like, mm-hmm. especially at this point. Like he's shown in the past that he's very inefficient with his touches whenever mm-hmm. he has been given touches. And a lot of that is trying to do too much with the football. Because back in his college days at Arizona State, he was that guy. Like he mm-hmm. he was making a lot of people miss. He was tackle breaking. And it just hasn't translated to the NFL, but his size and speed does. If he can get moving forward, you know. Maybe he'll get lucky, even if he, even if he doesn't see a clear lane. If he runs through it, breaks an arm tackle, he could be off the races because he has the speed to finish plays that Snell doesn't mm-hmm. have. Yeah, so, yeah. Sure. I want to see more of him, even though it, this game probably doesn't make them want to run him more. I, if we're gonna take Harris off the field, I think it should still be Balaj, obviously. Yeah, and like there was the point where Har- <clears throat> where Harris had the big twenty yard run and he came off, and yeah, some people were like, "Why are you taking him off?" Like I'm like, he's probably tired. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the guy had like 17 carries in the first yeah. half, I think, or something. Yeah, you got to like, yeah, spell him. Like, give it, give him a break. <laughs> yeah, I, I know we're kind of known for running our running backs yeah. into, into the ground, but like, let's not do it year one, you know? Let's, exactly. Let's save um, a little bit. A few other notes. I thought, so there was a play, and I, I can't remember exactly which drive it was, um, but there was a play where the Steelers ran like a, a play action shot. And it was targeted at Cody White. Yes. And yeah. It didn't, he, it was incomplete. I can't. Let me see. I'm trying I believe to find, it was. I think I'm I trying to find it. which drive it was because I'm wondering if it was the drive where um they did get the penalty and then had the touchdown. I believe it was, but let me. Then no, uh, no, no, because that was the. Uh-huh. Oh, yeah, that was the drive. I think. Yep. Um. So, I thought those plays were really good, and then the same thing with the McLeod uh, target that was incomplete, but because it was just an accurate. But I think this was a really good Matt Canada game, and I think part of that is like we've talked about is the offense staying on schedule because of the run game. But yeah. I thought Canada did a really good job of varying up formations. You know, the Steelers still like played from the bunch on third down a ton, but I think we saw a lot more like formation versatility. We saw some, you know, two back personnel with Derek Watt in, you know, we uh, even out of the shotgun, which I thought was interesting, you know, a lot of like different stuff, which I was like, okay, this is good. Like we're actually starting to kind of expand this offense, which I think is necessary at this point in the season. Yeah. And I, I hope that the reason why we hadn't seen it much is just because maybe there was some issues still in practice. Mm-hmm. They weren't showing that they could run it very yeah. well or something. 
because if they had the ability to do this this entire time and they haven't, that's just an indictment on yeah. the coaching staff. Yeah. So like, it's kind. Of, I'm gonna try to take the positive view and be like, hey, we did it this time. It must have taken till now for us. Like, even though realistically, it's probably more so that just they hadn't been doing it, or that mm-hmm. maybe even maybe even Ben didn't feel like he wanted to do some of this stuff. But mm-hmm. it it just you can tell that something clicked today that hadn't been there, and it happened against a defense that is a very good defense and will continue to be one this year. So it's very promising for me. For sure. Okay. So we let's get into our kind of three stars thing. Uh, you know, we haven't super prepped this, so this will be kind of off the cuff a yeah. little bit. But um, so g- give me your third star as the kind of guy who – you know, the least know, star of the, the star. least, the least, the least best, goodest player. <laughs> right, exactly. It's tough. I, I want to, as much as he had like the big touchdown to start and everything, I think the best receiver of the day is going to be going to Claypool. Like, I want to give him his shine because he had such a good day after the catch. He, he still, we, I still want to see more of the downfield, you know, jump ball stuff to him because of the size van she has. And there's one on the sideline that just was covered really well by, I mm-hmm. think, Sertain that just yeah. wasn't going to have a chance. But he oh, did such I, a good I, job. I want to come back to that. Can we – can Ben's – like, I tweeted this. Oh, yeah, like, the third and two shots, yeah. <laughs> Ben's third down strategy is mind-blowing because it's either – a 50 50 ball up the sideline, or it's a drag route, a route in the flat that is like behind the line, of considerably far away from the line to gain. And yeah. I'm like, just just throw something that is like five near the sticks. Yards. Like, oh my it's, God. It's crazy. You know, because you know what I personally think? And like, this is just my kind of like headcanon type of thing of it, and not like I don't have any way to necessarily prove this. I think that not to bring up his name because he also had a great day, unfortunately. Antonio Brown. Going back to him playing with him, that's what they did. Mm-hmm. They would they would take advantage of the fact that it was third and two and the defense had to worry about the run game, and they would take these sideline shots that would be impossibly hard to cover because of those two working yes. together. And it seems like Ben just still wants to do that, and it just it doesn't work that way if you don't have that guy. Like Claypool's great. He's not this so, like he's not the same type of player. So it's harder to complete those nearly as often as Ben used to do especially now with with a more limited skill set like mm-hmm. he he has to adjust that to some extent. I understand it's great. It's awesome when it works, mm-hmm. right? You you feel brilliant if you're the play caller if you're Ben cuz you're like, "Ah, you know, they thought yeah. we're just going to go with the sticks." But you're just it doesn't work to the level it used to. So get more get more used to trying to run those four, five, six yard plays on third and two opposed yeah. to the 50 yard plays. And like on paper, like, yes, Chase Claypool should be more efficient at catching 50, 50 vertical balls than Antonio Brown, but for whatever reason, he isn't right. And it's more <laughs> so like the sideline antics and bull yeah. crap that Brown used to pull off that really yeah. messed teams up. Like, mm-hmm. cause he would create just enough space off the sideline to be able to, to exactly. back shoulder and stuff. And yeah. It's just so hard to ask, you know, anyone to do that. So I think that you're, you're definitely right. And I saw that you tweeted about that. Like, it definitely needs to, to stop because it's giving up third down plays. We don't need to be throwing away basically. Right. But yeah, okay, Claypool so, overall, he's my definitely third star. Okay. Player. Yeah. I, that, that's tough. Cause I, I, feel, I feel like giving him the third star is, you know, a, a little disrespectful, but, but you know, well, I, I have two other guys that I think, yeah, you know, just, yeah. Yeah, for me. sure. Um, whew, okay. Um, I'm going to, I'll give him my second star and okay. kind of, again, just kind of echo everything you said. And I, I imagine this guy will probably, Oh man, this is this is tough because I I do want to be fair to the defense. Um, I feel like I do. I feel like I have to. Uh, I I I'll I'll give Ben Roethlisberger the third star, and you know I feel like he could probably be interchangeable for the second in that. You know, like we've been talking about this whole time, is that he was able to execute those short throws that required good placement, good accuracy on money downs. You know, the Steelers were really good on third down today, seven yeah. of twelve. You know, and the Broncos were only two of twelve, and then they converted three of their four fourth downs. But yeah, you know, th- those are really just important because they keep the offense on, like we said, on schedule. You know, Ben was fifteen for twenty five, and you know, I think you, I think there were probably maybe like two or three drops. So you know, you increase that a little bit. You know, there were a few off target throws, and again, I think it's something to do with his hand or arm injury. So I'll give him my third star, and you know, again, I think Claypool's my second just because he had such a big game. Um, you know, in a, in a variety of ways, like, you know, going vertically, you know, making plays after the catch in a variety of ways. So um, with that in mind, who is your second star? I got to give it to Cam. 
Yeah. He, like he, he was just so he, the way he impacts the game, it, it's very similar to me, like in the way that Watt JJ Watt used to specifically, mm-hmm. where if he can't get to you this year, especially, it seems like he's just knocking balls down. He's yeah. moving guys out of the way to help his guys get in the backfield. Like he's doing everything that you could possibly do as a defensive lineman to help his team and to play well. And this, honestly, you could very easily argue that this might be the best year of his career so far, at least through the first yeah. five games. Like mm-hmm. he's as great as he's been. I mean, he's been unbelievable to start the season, especially with the injuries surrounding him and not having to it there. Yes. And it's been yes. awesome to watch him play. Yes, absolutely. Um, and then I feel like we're probably going to pick the same guy as our first. Yeah, it's not. Yeah. It's Najee. Yeah, it's Najee. Okay, yeah. yeah. I mean, so he... I'll take I'll take Najee for this one. So for it. obviously, like as we said, you know, this was the game where he really did get some help from the offensive line, kind of for the first time like green bay was a little easier sledding yeah. but this game you know he was really able to create you know he did have that big chunk run of 20 yards he had a few you know at least five yard gains which are really good and like we said like we've been saying these past few weeks like he's able to just grind out those extra yards after he gets touched and, you know just keep the offense moving he wasn't as big a threat in the receiving game i think some of that was just inaccuracy by ben you know he fell down the one time mm-hmm. but you know it, as long if they're not featuring him as much in the past game like we saw claypool get a ton of targets and so, you know, I'm, I'm okay with if he's not going to be, you know, the number one wide receiver on this team. <laughs> yeah, I mean, coming in with 26 catches is kind of ridiculous for... I think he know. led all rookies. Yes. Not rookie yeah. running backs. So just rookies. All rookies, including receivers like Jamar Chase. And guys, yeah, he led all... all guys. Yeah. I think he actually was a leading receiver among running backs in terms of catches, period, in the NFL, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah, that's probably, that, yeah that wouldn't shock me either. So, and granted, a lot of that is more out of necessity and not yes. out of you know, just him being fantastic mm-hmm. as good as he was being. But it, and we talked about a couple times in the past, like what I loved about this game ultimately and what I'm going to take away from it is they committed to the run game and they stuck with it. And I understand it was more successful early on than it's been at any point, but they stuck with it. They didn't go away from it until, you know, it made sense to, or to try to get the chunk plays in the passing game. And this is, this is realistically where we're at on offense. Like this has got to be the strategy. If we want to compete down the stretch, like next week, when we go up against Seattle, that defense is not that good. It mm-hmm. just isn't. As in run game, we should be able to realistically replicate this game plan against them. And with Geno Smith now starting in place, Russ Wilson is granted he looked pretty good down the stretch of there, you know, against them. But I presume that the defense can at least handle him well enough in the same way they handled the Broncos today. Where if we can replicate this game, the style of game, we can start to reel off a couple wins here, maybe, and try to save the season. Yeah, I mean. With the with the Seahawks, you know, missing Russell Wilson, you know, the Steelers are facing the possibility of going into the bye week at five at five hundred, you know, right? Which three, I which, did not expect. No, absolutely not. Like if you asked me after the Bengals loss, you know, <laughs> were we gonna <laughs> were we gonna get to five hundred? I'd be like, absolutely, freaking not. No. Um, but yeah, I mean, things are looking up. You know, like we, I'm hoping that you know a lot of these injuries. It seems like Juju might be out next week. That's kind of a yeah. given. Um, yeah. but you know, they'll probably get Sutton, Washington back. You know. I, I imagine they'll probably get to it back after the bye week. We could see Zach Banner and Anthony McFarland return to the lineup, which I think McFarland getting back would be huge for this offense. Yeah, giving us a better um, number two to go to. Exactly, Harris, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, this this could be, you know, this is going to be a big week, and we promise we're going to get our preview of the Seahawks yeah. game out this week. <laughs> yep. um, but in the meantime, that's, that's going to be it for us for our recap of this game. A really, really exciting, stressful win. <sighs> yeah, finally, <laughs> but we can finally breathe a little bit and kind of, be hopeful i think for the first time yes. in a while so yes exactly so in the meantime uh shane let people know where they can find your work you can find me at shane kubis on twitter i see me like i said live tweeting a lot of the game i kind of started to go away from it at the end just because i was actually interested in what i was seeing in post to what i was <laughs> you know last couple of weeks um you also find me at still curtain for articles and also for here with the atb steelers look for us there Absolutely. And I'm at Mitchell T. Wolf, W-O-L-F-E on Twitter. And, you know, again, follow it, follow me there, follow Shane, follow Steelers ATB on Twitter for, you know, where you can find this podcast. And obviously we thank you for listening to us and we look forward to having you back later this week.